Thank you for joining us today for our second webinar in our Creating a Better Future webinar series. This series was created uh, due to the fact that we had to uh, cancel our national conference at the end of May. And uh, we are very happy that you're willing to join us and we're very pleased that we have uh, the presenters that are willing to work with us on this virtual format. So today's topic is on the science behind food allergy. I'm Jennifer Gertz, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and I'm joined by Dr. Alyssa Abrams. As many of you are aware, our organization is a national nonprofit charity and a, the Canada's leading patient organization, and we're committed to educating, supporting, and advocating for the more than 2 million Canadians living with food allergies. What you may not know is that we are completely reliant on the generosity of donors to fund our work, so if you're able uh, to consider Food Allergy Ch uh, Canada in your charitable giving, we would greatly appreciate that. So similar to other webinars that we've done, we'll have a presentation from our expert followed by a Q&A. And I'd like to thank everyone for submitting their questions in advance. Um, that really helps us inform uh, the content and we will be having some Q&As uh, following the presentation that we, get, we hope to get to, to most of those questions. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first, this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions that you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. All participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. And if you have any questions during the session, uh, please submit them in the chat box uh, throughout the webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And lastly, this webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or share it with others. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Alyssa Abrams. Dr. Abrams is a Canadian uh, pediatric allergist, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics section of allergy and clinical immunology at the University of Manitoba and the co-author of the Canadian Pediatric Society Practice Point on the Introduction of Allergenic Foods. She is also the Vice Chair of the Amphylaxis and Food Allergy Section of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and President of the Allergy Section at the Canadian Pediatric Society. She is also a member of our Healthcare Advisory Vote Board here at Food Allergy Canada. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Abrams to take us through the science behind food allergy. Dr. Abrams. So thank you very much for having me today. And Jennifer, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I am gonna go through the science behind food allergy and we're hoping to leave a lot of time for questions at the end as well. So as Jennifer has already said, this presentation is really for informational purposes only. If there's specific questions about specific family members that have allergies, it's really best to speak to your own physician about that. The goal of this presentation is to go through a few things and they all relate to the science of food allergy. So the first is to understand the process of sensitization to foods or how we think you become food allergic. Stemming from that, we're going to talk about the role of early feeding in food allergy prevention. After we talk about early feeding, we're going to talk about what happens in an allergic reaction and how to recognize it. And then finally, the science of why we treat allergic reactions the way that we do. So food allergies are very common. A recent study across Canada show that about 6% of Canadians have at least one food allergy. And there's been a rise in food allergy over the past few decades. In fact, if you look across Canada, not only do 6% of Canadians have a food allergy, but up to 50% of Canadians are indirectly impacted by food allergy on a regular basis. And as a result, there's been a real interest in learning more about food allergy, including how we prevent food allergy. And this has really become a very primary public health goal because this condition is so common and often lifelong within our population. Now, before I get into the science of things, I just wanna contextualize science for a minute because there's often a frustration 
when we're talking about science that we don't have the answers yet. And really when we're talking about science, the key to science is actually coming up with the right questions to ask. And I'm gonna walk you through an example of that. But it's not really about the right answers, but about the right questions and the process of using those questions to come to an answer. This is a really interesting story about how food allergy science, in particular food allergy prevention, evolved with a really good question. And it involves the two gentlemen you see in the picture, Dr. Yitzchak Katz and Professor Gideon Lack. So Dr. Yitzchak Katz works in Israel as an allergist and Professor Gideon Lack works in the UK as an allergist. And this was several years ago, actually over a decade ago, they were chatting. And at that time in the UK, there was this drastic rise in peanut allergy. And Professor Gideon Lack said to Dr. Yitzchak Katz, you know, I'm really interested in why peanut allergy is rising so rapidly in our population. And Dr. Katz said, it's not in our population. We barely have any peanut allergy in Israel. And so this became a question. Well, is there a difference in peanut allergy rates between Israel and the UK? And it led to a study. What they did is they took Jewish children who lived in Israel and Jewish children who lived in the UK. And they looked at the rates of peanut allergy between these two populations. And that's the picture you can see on the right. And that blue line where it says 80 over 99 is the number of peanut allergic children in the UK. And the red number, 16 over 77, is the number in Israel. And what they found was that, yes, in fact, there was a tenfold higher rate of peanut allergy in the UK compared to Israel. So this question and this initial very general discussion actually panned out. There was a big difference. Now, because they had Jewish children in both populations, they assumed that the genetic makeup would be relatively similar. So what was the environmental difference between the two groups? Well, in the UK, they were following the guidelines at the time that recommended staying away from peanut until toddlerhood. Whereas in Israel, there's a peanut snack called bamba, which is 50% peanut protein and is dissolvable in the mouth and a very, very common weaning food in infancy. And in Israel, babies were starting peanut early in life and eating it very regularly. So the difference between these two populations was the age of introduction of peanut into the baby's diet. And this observation didn't fit with the current hypothesis about food allergy prevention. So some of you who are part of this webinar will remember these old guidelines that came out in 2003 that said, wait, don't feed peanuts nuts, fish, until babies at least three years of age. And this guideline, it's important to know, was really based on how we thought you became allergic at the time. So the thought in 2003 was that you became allergic through your gut, and that if you waited for the digestive tract to mature, you would help prevent food allergy. But it's really important to know that when this guideline came out, it was really based on expert opinion and thoughts about how you become allergic, as opposed to a lot of really robust science. Now, when the study from Israel came out, it sort of shifted the paradigm and we started to think, you know what, are we wrong with these recommendations? In fact, is earlier introduction beneficial? And this started to then fit in with a broader hypothesis or a broader thought that you don't actually become allergic through your digestive tract. You become allergic through the surface of your skin. And this is called the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. And if you look at the author of this hypothesis at the bottom, Professor Gideon Lack, it's the same person who was involved in that peanut study that compared the UK Israel peanut rates. And this theory about how you become allergic has been shown in many, many studies or supported in many, many studies to be accurate. And basically what it says is, in short, if you eat foods, it protects you against allergy. If you put foods on the surface of the skin or if you're exposed to foods through your environment, it causes allergy. Now the science behind that takes a little bit more time to explain. But if you look at the right-hand side of the, this cute picture of the baby, 
It says oral exposure, meaning exposure through the, the digestive tract or you eat it. And the science there basically is that your digestive tract has a lot of regulatory T cells or cells that are used to teaching your body not to react to foods. Your digestive tract is used to seeing weird stuff and it's used to priming your immune system not to react to it. So effectively what happens if you eat a food as a baby is it's seen through the immune cells in your digestive tract and those immune cells teach the rest of your body, this is okay, don't react to it. Now, another way your body can see food is cutaneous exposure, meaning being exposed through the surface of the skin. And there's been lots of studies that show that things like peanut protein are present in our environment. And if you think about a baby like this baby that has eczema, so has some increased allergy cells under the surface of the skin and has a less robust skin barrier, so more proteins can enter through the surface of the skin. What happens if you're not eating that food, but yet being exposed in the environment, especially if you have eczema, is that those allergy cells under the surface of the skin teach the body to react. They teach the body to mount an allergic response. And that's a main sort of driving theory now about how you become allergic. And as I've said, this is a really different way of thinking about how we develop allergies in the past 10 years, 15 years or so. Now, a big move forward in our specialty, and this study also involved Professor Gideon Lack, was the leap or learning early about peanut study. And this study was a randomized controlled trial. I'm going to talk a little bit later in the presentation about the difference between different types of studies. But for now, a randomized control trial is the best type of study that we can have because it really helps to control for all kinds of different variables and is the best way that we can ensure that the difference between groups in the study is actually what's leading to the outcome. So the difference between the groups in the study was age of peanut introduction. What they did is they took 640 infants in the UK who they considered to be at high risk of peanut allergy, either because they had severe eczema or they already had egg allergy. And they randomized them, meaning they chose which group these kids would be in. And they said either you're going to start peanut in infancy and you're going to eat it regularly a few times a week until you're five, or you're going to completely avoid peanut until you're five. And then the outcome, what they were measuring was how many kids were allergic at the age of five. And overall, what they found was that there was a dramatic 80% reduction in peanut allergy in this high-risk group, in the group that ate it in infancy, compared to the group that avoided peanut until they were five. And what's also interesting about this study was that they allergy tested the babies to peanut before they fed them. And they didn't just include babies that had a negative peanut allergy test but they also included babies that had a mildly positive allergy test. And they showed a dramatic reduction in peanut allergy with eating early in both of those groups, which really supports that in a higher risk baby population, feeding early, in particular for peanut, may really reduce rates of peanut allergy. After the LEAP study guidelines changed and uh, we've already talked a little bit about the guideline that came out in 2003 that said feed late and how that guideline was really based on the thought of how you become allergic. Now, we often get questions, we're having emerging science, why aren't guidelines changing? And the reason is there's quite a robust process that we like to follow when we make allergy guidelines or medical guidelines in general. And the story I've just walked you through of that observation about differences in peanut allergy between the Israel and the UK, that study question, is there a difference in the environment that's contributing? The studying of that question, which was the Israel-UK peanut study that showed that in fact, yes, there's a tenfold higher rate of peanut allergy in infants in the UK. That leads to sort of this best type of study that we have, which is a randomized controlled trial, is ideally 
the steps that are involved in a change in guideline recommendations. And this is what we were waiting for to change the guidelines around when to feed babies to prevent allergy. And this is the background to this really commonly and understandably asked question, which is why have the guidelines changed so much? You went from completely avoid to now actively introduce. And the simple answer is we just have so much more science to back up the recommendations that we're now making. Over the past decade or decade and a half, we've learned that you don't actually become allergic through your digestive tract, you become allergic through your skin. We also found that during the period of avoidance, and we talked about this with the UK, rates of allergy were dramatically increasing. And we now have studies, including the best type of medical study that we can do to show that eating early is protective. So as a result, the Canadian Pediatric Society, in addition to multiple other international pediatric and allergy societies, have released guidelines on timing of allergic solid introduction for infants at high risk. There's some mild differences between the guidelines, but a lot of the basic take home points are the same. Now, when we're thinking who's at risk for allergy, in Canada, we consider an infant to be high risk if they have allergies themselves, meaning they already have eczema or another food allergy, or if someone in the infant's immediate family has allergies. So that would include things like eczema, food allergy, hay fever, asthma. And if an infant fits that criteria, meaning they have allergies or someone in their immediate family has allergies, we're recommending introducing allergic solids at around six, but not before four months of age. So somewhere between that four to six month interval. When we're talking about allergic solids, the most common allergic foods are milk, egg, the nuts, so peanut, tree nut, wheat, fish, meaning both fin fish and shellfish, and soy. A really, really important point, in my opinion, perhaps the most important point, even more important than when a food is introduced, is to make sure it remains a part of baby's diet. So when we go back to that science of how you become allergic, and we talked about how if you're exposed to a food through your digestive tract, your immune system effectively primes your body not to react. Your immune system needs reminders. It doesn't remember long-term not to react. And if you keep the food in your diet effectively, or the baby's diet, effectively what you're doing is reminding the body on an ongoing basis, the immune system not to start reacting. In terms of the timing and how much to feed, there's a lot of questions here, but basically feed one at a time but you don't have to have an unnecessary delay between each new food. So you don't have to wait weeks between feeding these foods. Ideally, a day or two between each new allergic solid is fine. And then of course, as for all solid feeding in babies, it has to be when baby is developmentally ready to start taking solids in general before you feed allergic solids. So the baby has to be able to sit with support and have some control of their neck muscles. There's a really good Canadian Pediatric Society guideline on developmental readiness for feeding if anyone is interested. We often get asked the question, which foods should be introduced early? We've already talked about the fact that there's at least eight common allergic foods, maybe even more than that. And for some families, there's practical limitations to feeding all of these foods really early in infancy and then keeping them in the diet on an ongoing basis. So some practical tips here. Really, the best studies we have so far are for peanut and egg. And when I focus on early introduction, commonly, I focus the most on those two. There are also some studies for cow's milk and wheat. So peanut egg would be, in my opinion, the highest priority followed by milk and grains. That being said, if a family is motivated, there's no study that shows that delaying these foods is helpful. So certainly there is no risk to feeding all of them early. And we do think that the way you become allergic is likely similar for most allergic foods. So 
even though we don't have studies for all of these foods, we think that likely the mechanism is the same and there may be a benefit. As I said, it's practically not always possible to do all of these. Now, a word about tree nuts. So there hasn't been a study looking at early tree nut introduction. And we talk about this a lot in our specialty because at this stage, I'm not sure how many more big studies are gonna be done looking at early versus delayed introduction because there's so much science that supports feeding early. But we're seeing a lot of tree nut allergy in our specialty and in particular cashew allergy. And some of these allergies tend to be more serious. So even though we don't have as much of a science for feeding early for tree nuts, I tend to also recommend if a family is comfortable to start age appropriate forms of tree nuts like a cashew nut butter that's smooth as well as focusing on peanut egg, milk and grains. Here are some practical ways to feed allergic solids. But the lowest point here is actually the most important, which is there are no absolutes. You know, there are guidelines around this and a lot of them are based on the studies, but we don't know for sure how much, how often, there are no absolutes. The big thing is start it relatively young at around six months, not before four months of age, feed it in a developmentally appropriate way. And then if it's well tolerated, meaning if you're not noticing a reaction, keep it in the diet on an ongoing basis. For peanuts, something you can do is take some smooth peanut butter and add some hot water so that it's really liquidy and then wait for it to cool down. You can either offer it alone on the tip of a spoon or you can add it to something baby's already eating, like an infant cereal or a pure egg. You can also boil an egg and puree it and mix it with a tolerated food. You can eat the egg white, you can eat the egg yolk, you can eat both. The more allergic part is actually the white. So if you're gonna focus on feeding something, I focus on the egg white. We've already talked about becoming allergic through the surface of your skin. So it's never recommended to rub foods on the surface of the skin. Always make sure baby sees the food through their immune system first in the digestive tract and not through the surface of the skin. And then we've also talked about the fact that when you feed allergic solids, it's just like feeding any solid, you have to make sure that it's not a choking hazard. So for example, never feed whole peanuts. In addition to feeding early, there are lots of other factors that contribute to the development of food allergy. And a big emerging field and an exciting field, although there remain some questions, is the microbiome or the bacteria that exists in our gut. And there's been lots of studies that show that altering that gut bacteria may alter the risk of food allergies. So for example, being born via C-section, so not being exposed to mom's bacteria through the birth canal can increase potentially the risk of food allergy. Antibiotic use early in life potentially can increase the risk. Um, how the diet of the baby can increase the risk. Whether baby lives around pets, which increases microbial diversity, in the baby's environment may actually lower the risk of food allergy. If they don't have pets, it might increase it. If there's more kids around, there's more infections, there's more microbial diversity, once again, it may lower the risk. There's a lot of questions and there's a lot of emerging science here. We don't have all the answers yet, but this is a really interesting emerging field as well. And there's certainly a lot of studies coming out that supports the fact that in some way, the gut microflora of the baby may play a role in either tolerizing the baby to the food or increasing the chance that they become allergic. There are some risk factors that you can't control for food allergy development, like boys, when they're young, are more likely to develop food allergy than girls. There's a genetic heritability, a family history that contributes. So food allergies are more likely to develop if there's a family history of allergies already. And then there's also some interesting studies looking at vitamin D exposure. So in particular, sun, vitamin D that you get through sunlight as opposed to vitamin D that's supplemented into the diet. And there's some studies that show that, for example, if a baby is born in the winter, 
they have a higher risk of food allergy than if a baby is born in the summer. And we think that part of that is related to vitamin D exposure or natural sunlight. However, this is where we have some remaining questions in science. So we've talked about the microbiome, we've just talked about vitamin D, but we don't know yet whether, for example, babies should be using probiotics to prevent food allergy, or you should be supplementing baby's diets with vitamin D to prevent food allergy. There remains a lot of questions in the field of allergy prevention, and our current recommendation right now is that there just isn't enough evidence to support any of these interventions. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of the studies that have looked at these measures have been observational, meaning they're not a randomized study. And the issue with observational studies or non-randomized studies is that there can be bias in the people that register for these studies. So the people that participate in studies can be inherently different from the general population. And there can also be things like called confounders. And so a confounder is something that's that can affect the outcome that you're not necessarily measuring for. So for example, it may not be that children who are born um, in certain areas are at lower risk because they were vo born via delivery instead of C-section. It may be that there's a racial difference or a socioeconomic difference or a smoke exposure difference between those populations that's contributing but isn't being measured. And so when we have observational studies, it's often harder to make a firm conclusion that yes, this is contributing to that and we need to do this as an intervention. And this is a really interesting slide that I often use to show the difference between what we call correlation versus causation. And so when you have a randomized study, you can pretty definitively say, like the LEAP study, eating early prevented peanut allergy. The big difference between these two groups of infants was when they were fed peanut, and that's because of the study design. So it's a causation. Eating early prevented peanut allergy or eating late caused peanut allergy. When you have observational studies, meaning you're not assigning the outcome between the groups, you can say there's a correlation, meaning infants who are born in the winter we're more likely to have food allergy, but it doesn't mean that being born in the winter was the cause. And if you look at this slide, it shows divorce rates in Maine and the correlation with per capita consumption of margarine. And so you know that divorce rates, or we think, has nothing to do with margarine consumption, but you can see that the evidence would support that it might. Of course, there's something else in Maine that's contributing to this. And this really nicely illustrates the difference between a randomized study where you can say this is a causation versus a broader populational study where you can say, it looks like there's a similarity, but it might not be margarine that's causing the divorce rates in Maine. Now we're gonna pivot a bit and move towards how we classify food allergy. And broadly, we classify food allergy as an adverse health effect that arises from an immune response and occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. And the really important points from that big medical definition is that it's an immune response and it happens every time. It occurs reproducibly every time you eat the food. This is in contrast to non-immune adverse reactions like intolerances. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about intolerances in upcoming slides. Now, when we think about food allergy, it's an immune response. We've already said that. And you can classify it according to the type of an immune response. And I'm going to focus on IgE or immunoglobulin E mediated allergy, which are things like anaphylaxis. There's also non IgE mediated allergies, which tend to be digestive tract allergies, things like food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome or FPIs, or proctocolitis, which is sometimes called cow's milk protein allergy in babies. And then there's a third category, which is some immune combination of IgE and other cells. And an example of that is eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE. Now, the science behind a food allergy. You have this IgE bound to mast cells or allergy cells in your body. And an allergen, which is a protein that induces an allergic response, and that's why it's called an allergen, 
cross-links these IgE molecules. And when it cross-links them, it causes the mast cells to release all kinds of chemicals that they store inside the cell. And it's these chemicals that cause the allergic reaction. And what they do is they act on multiple organs in the body. And you can see in the picture, it's the common organs that are affected by a food allergy or what you see in a food allergic reaction. So you get hives on the surface of the skin. You can have um, some constricting of the muscles of the lungs and that leads to things like coughing and wheezing. It affects the digestive tract and that leads to things like vomiting, nausea, diarrhea as well. And you can also have alterations in what happens in the blood vessels. And that causes things like redness of the face. And it also causes swelling of the upper respiratory tract as well. How that science manifests in a baby or an older child, we'll look at the right-hand side first, and then we'll go to the picture of the baby. The most common symptom of an allergic reaction is skin symptoms. It's present 80 to 90% of the time if it's an IgE mediated reaction. And the most common symptom that you'd see is hives, which look like mosquito bites or welts on the surface of the skin. They're itchy, they move around and they go away within 24 hours. You can also get swelling, redness, warmth, but it's really hives and then followed by swelling as the most two common skin symptoms. You can also have breathing problems. Coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath are the most common. Gastrointestinal problems, vomiting, and diarrhea are very common there. You can have heart problems as well. Those are less common, and they're quite uncommon in children. And then you can have, it can affect your brain as well. And so you can have this sense of impending doom in older children. In infants, it affects the brain a little bit differently. What you see in babies is behavioral changes. So the skin symptoms are the same, the breathing symptoms, the gastrointestinal symptoms are very, very similar. But for the brain symptoms, you get irritability usually in a baby. Now, anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction and it's defined that way. It's a serious allergic reaction that happens quickly but can cause death practically. Anaphylaxis can be thought of as two or more body symptoms affected. So skin plus breathing, skin plus gastrointestinal tract, et cetera. Some rules of thumb about food allergy, in particular IgE mediated food allergy that are really important if you're trying to figure out whether or not someone's having an allergic reaction. They happen quickly, almost always within two hours. We've already talked about the fact that they usually almost always involve the skin. They can also involve the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract. You can have heart symptoms, brain symptoms also. The reaction goes away within hours, almost always within 24 hours. So it comes on quickly and goes away quickly, but will happen reproducibly every single time you're exposed to that food. Now, isolated breathing problems, while you can have breathing problems as part of an allergic reaction, isolated breathing problems like upper respiratory symptoms, chronic runny nose are unlikely to be a food allergy, headaches, chronic tummy problems in the absence of the skin symptoms and behavioral symptoms in the absence of sort of a broader big reaction are not usually food allergy. There can be different severities between food allergic reactions and previous reactions do not predict in general future reactions. There can be someone who has a very mild initial reaction and then has a future very severe reaction. The opposite can happen as well. So the first reaction being very severe doesn't mean that it's necessarily a more severe allergy than the first reaction being mild because reactions can change. And part of why they change is related to all of these other factors. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but for example, we know for sure that if a child has an infection, they're more likely to have an allergic reaction and potentially it's more likely to be severe because it alters your immune system. If you have asthma, you already have inflammation in your lungs. If you have asthma, and especially if your asthma is not well controlled, you're more likely to have a severe allergic reaction if it happens. Alcohol, certain medications, exercise, alter your blood vessels, and they alter how likely it is for food to be absorbed. And once again, those things alter the type of an allergic reaction you have, in, including how severe the allergic reaction may be. Now I'm going to pivot a bit 
and talk about food allergy versus food intolerance. And I took this slide directly off Cincinnati Children's Hospital because I think it's a really good broad overview of the difference. Now, it's important to know that both allergy and intolerance are uncomfortable. They both include symptoms that are ongoing and that affect quality of life. But there's a few differences between intolerance and allergy that are really important. And the first is food allergy can be life-threatening. Food intolerance does not tend to be. So for food allergy, we tend to recommend carrying epinephrine auto injector, and I'll talk about that. For food intolerance, we don't. Food allergy happens reproducibly every time you eat the food, even if you only eat a very small amount and happens quickly. Food intolerance may not happen every time. So for example, lactose intolerance may happen if you have an ice cream, but may not happen if you have a small creamer in your tea. It can take hours, it may take more food, and it can take longer to go away. The other difference is that in general, intolerance largely involves the digestive tract, where in general, IgE-mediated allergy almost always involves the skin, but can involve the digestive tract as well. And this leads to IgG testing or food panel testing. You know, unfortunately for food intolerances, for many types of intolerances, we don't have the science yet to understand exactly what's happening or to diagnose it. And so as a result, often people are turning to these panel testing, which measures IgG. Now, from an allergist's perspective, IgG does not measure allergy. So IgG is another immune cell like IgG, but from an allergy or immunology perspective, a positive IgG test is actually a sign of immune memory. It just means that the person's been exposed to the food and actually might tolerate the food. So in fact, when we're looking at things like immunotherapy, and we'll talk a bit about that, I think, at the end, IgG is something we measure to actually help us tell if the child's outgrowing the allergy. IgG testing is not supported by research to date and is not supported by multiple allergy societies, including the Canadian Allergy Society. In fact, many societies have put out quite strong position statements against its use. And on the right-hand side, at the very bottom, the aaaai.org, that is a really helpful link that goes through IgG testing or panel testing and the reasons it's not recommended. Now, allergists love epinephrine. And in fact, the main therapy for allergic reactions is epinephrine. And the reason why epinephrine is so important is because it completely stops all of the phases of this allergic reaction. And it's the only medicine that does that. It is the only medicine that is life-saving in an allergic reaction. So for example, epinephrine acts on your blood vessels. And one of the things that gets people into trouble with allergic reactions is swelling in the upper airway. And what it does is it lowers that swelling. It also raises your blood pressure. It works on the lungs. It works on the digestive tract. It works on the skin. It works on the heart. So it causes the heart to pump faster. It opens up the airways. It lowers swelling throughout the body. It stops wheezing and it reduces hives. But it's really important to know that hives are not life-threatening. So while hives are itchy and uncomfortable, the big thing you wanna do is protect the upper and lower airways and the heart. Finally, epinephrine actually works on that allergy cell, the mast cell itself, and it stops it from continuing to release these chemicals. And as a result, it helps stop the allergic reaction from continuing. A few really important points about epinephrine. It's always safe. Even if you have a heart condition, a breathing condition, in the forms that are available in auto injectors, it is safe. It can be life-saving. And in fact, the studies that have looked at fatalities or deaths due to anaphylaxis, the big factor that's consistent is often a delay or not using the epinephrine auto injector at all. Treatments like antihistamines can help hives, but as we've just talked about, hives are not what gets people into trouble with life-threatening reactions. Antihistamines are not life-saving. They should never be used in place of the epinephrine auto-injector. And using epinephrine quickly reduces the chance of ending up in the hospital or having a bad outcome from a severe allergic reaction. 
So thank you very much for listening. We're going to take some questions now, and I'm just going to leave you with a few concluding messages. We think you become allergic through your skin, not your digestive tract. And in fact, feeding early might prevent that, especially in higher risk babies. The current recommendations are if a baby is higher risk, start feeding them common allergens at around six, but not before four months of age. If it's well tolerated, keep it in the diet regularly. When you're looking for a reaction, the most common reaction is skin and you're looking in general for hives and swelling. These reactions happen quickly, almost always within two hours, practically usually within 10 to 15 minutes. They go away within a day and they occur reproducibly every time you eat the food. Most common sign of an allergic reaction to skin symptoms, you can also have gastrointestinal respiratory symptoms as well. And the main therapy to treat these allergic reactions is epinephrine. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Abrams. Um, we are gonna now move into some questions and I would invite you to turn on your webcam um, uh, so that we can actually see you in person. Hi, everyone. Great. Well, thank you so much for that really informative webinar. Um, I'm going to get started on some of the questions, both questions that we received in advance and some that have come in uh, through the chat box. Um, you talked about uh, in quite a bit of detail the difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance. Um, and, and I think that was really helpful because it's very important to, uh, that people understand if they're at risk of anaphylaxis or not. One of the questions that came in about symptoms, though, was related to hives. Is mm -hmm. hives, seeing hives every time uh, a, a related to food allergy? So yes, yes. Hives are one of the most common symptoms of food allergy and are in fact a main way to differentiate intolerances from allergy. You know, it can get quite difficult because intolerances can involve nausea, sometimes bloating, diarrhea, and so can allergic reactions. Hives tend to be allergic reactions if it's a true hive. So a true hive is raised, wealth-like, itchy, and goes away within 24 hours. Okay, okay, actually that's actually a good point because one of the things that I'm, I'm gonna direct uh, folks to, we do find this, you know, people are asking, well, how do I really know whether what I'm seeing is an allergy or not? And it might be helpful for people to um, visit our website um, because we do have under tools and downloads a, a link to Allergy Check, which is an app that will help people understand their specific symptoms and whether it may be caused by a food allergy. So that might be something that people consider uh, taking a look at at some point in time. Um, now on to the second set of questions here. Uh, there were a number of questions that came in about um, why there are more allergies today. And you touched mm -hmm. on the fact that we had this, um, you know, the, the lack of guide or the guidance was to avoid um, and that there's this dual allergen exposure uh, theory that's emerging. But are there some other things that you can speak to that, that we think we know in terms of why there are more allergies today than there has been in the past? Sure, so this is a really interesting question because it speaks to how far we've come in science from a food allergy prevention standpoint, but also how much we have left to learn. So what's exciting is that we now have really good evidence that in higher risk babies, feeding early is preventative. And part of the reason there is an increase, was an increase in allergies was because these foods were being avoided. And that goes back to that UK Israel study. And that's really exciting because we now have a potential way to prevent allergies, especially in high risk children. But where we have a lot left to learn is these other environmental and family factors. So we know there's a heritability among families and we know that to some degree, if you're born into a family with allergies, you're more likely to develop it. It's passed down to some degree. That being said, we see new onset allergies in children all the time where there isn't a strong family history. We also think the environment and in particular, the higher income Western environments may be contributing. So for example, children are less likely to be living on farms they're more likely to be clean. They're having less infections. There's lower family sizes. There's changes in how babies are born and how medications are used early in life. And these all feed into that broader spectrum of 
what bacteria are in our guts. And we do have studies that show that the bacteria in our guts do have an ability to influence the allergy cells or the regulatory cells that prevent allergy. But there's a lot of questions here. So exactly what gut bacteria should you have? Is it helpful to supplement with things like probiotics? And for a lot of that, we just don't have the answers yet. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, just a follow on question related to uh, early introduction. We just had another question come in around whether a parent should be afraid to first try an allergen in an infant? Mm -hmm. Like, is it possible mm -hmm. to have an extreme mm -hmm. reaction on a first try? So this is a great question and very poignant right now during COVID-19 because all of us are trying to stay at home as much as possible and stay out of hospitals as much as possible. And in fact, I was a co-author on a CPS blog or guidance around food introduction during COVID-19. And that was a question we specifically looked at. Is it safe? And the answer is yes. So in these studies that have looked at early introduction, there is a risk of a reaction. Most of the reactions, even in high-risk babies, tend to be skin reactions in early infancy if, if food is fed early. The chance of a severe reaction is definitively less than 2%, but we actually think even much lower than that. And there's never been a fatality or a death with first feeding of food in infancy. So yes, even during these uncertain times when there's an understandable hesitancy on all of our parts to do anything that would increase risk, we are recommending exactly the same, which is feed at home and feed early. Perfect, okay, thank you. Now we talk an awful lot about uh, uh, infants and children, but I, I wanna move to a bit of conversation about adults. and. Mm -hmm. um, kind of onset of uh, allergies uh, later in life. Can you speak to why some of that is happening and why some people will develop allergies uh, while, while others don't, but really also why, why are things showing up in adulthood? What's the thinking there? Okay, so there's a few scientific theories behind this. Hormonal changes can affect allergy development. And we talked a bit about that in terms of risk factors, male versus female. But for example, pregnancy can change your immune system. And we do see some allergies develop after pregnancy because of a modulation in the immune system mm -hmm. hormonally. There's also cross-reactivity between some foods and some environmental allergens. So one example of that is oral allergy syndrome or pollen food allergy syndrome, which is an isolated mouth allergy that usually develops to fruits and vegetables and doesn't tend to happen in early childhood. It tends to happen in adolescents or adults. And what happens there is you become environmentally allergic to pollens, things like trees. And there are proteins in pollens that are very similar to some of the proteins in fruits and vegetables. And after you become allergic to the environmental allergy, your allergy cells get a little confused. And when they see these proteins that are similar in fruits and vegetables, they start reacting to that as well. Another example of that is there's a cross reactivity between the major allergen in dust and the major allergen in shellfish. And that's a reason why adults can develop shellfish allergy or a thought reason, hypothesized reason why adults can develop shellfish allergy as well. Okay, great. Uh, let's turn a little bit to um, uh, understanding more about anaphylaxis biphasic reactions. And, and if you mm -hmm. can help uh, people understand what biphasic reactions are. And then I'd also like to add in a question that came also in from the, cha the chat box around administering an adult dose auto injector. Is it safe for junior and vice versa? Okay. Okay. So if you can cover sure. those two things, that would be great. Absolutely. So biphasic reactions are secondary reactions, meaning you have an allergic reaction, it gets better but then it comes back. The timing is variable. The reaction has to go away and come back for it to be biphasic, but it can be anywhere from a few hours to, in some studies, even up to a few days later, although that would be very delayed. Practically, we often don't see that. It's said that biphasic reactions happen about 20% of the time, although practically, especially in children, we don't see it nearly that frequently. And a really good way to prevent a biphasic reaction is to use the epinephrine auto injector early. Because part of what we think the science behind a biphasic reaction is that those mast cells that we talked about, those allergy cells, release those chemicals, but those chemicals then stimulate inflammatory cells. And those inflammatory cells take longer to get activated. And if you can stop those chemicals from being released, you stop those inflammatory cells from becoming activated, and you help stop 
what we think contributes to a biphasic reaction. Now, in terms of using the epinephrine autoinjector, it's very safe to, to do that. You can use an adult dose in a kid. If you only have a junior dose and it's an adult and that's all you have, absolutely use it. You know, when we prescribe epinephrine autoinjectors to children and we're giving the junior dose, we usually give two doses because if an allergic reaction doesn't get better with the first dose, we'll often say use a second dose five to 15 minutes later. So if all you have is an adult dose available, and a child, especially if a child's having a more severe reaction, meaning there's two or more body systems affected, yes, you can use the adult dose if that's what you have. Okay, great. Couple more follow-on questions to the use of uh, epinephrine. The role of antihistamines. Can you clarify mm -hmm. for us, um, you know, in, in, in a case where someone is seeing hives, should they go mm -hmm. to antihistamines first or should they go directly to epinephrine? And also, if you could speak to what, we're, what we've been hearing about in terms of Benadryl and the use of Benadryl okay. as an antihistamine. Okay, so there's a few important take-home points there. The first is that antihistamines, especially if it's anaphylaxis, meaning it's two or more body systems affected, or I even say if it's only hives, but it's hives spreading suddenly, Antihistamines are never first line, the epinephrine auto-injector is, because the only thing that will prevent that swelling in the upper airway and help keep your lungs and your heart working properly is epinephrine. Antihistamines will help hives. And if you want to add an antihistamine on to help with hives, you can, but it's not gonna be life-saving. It should never be used first. If you're gonna use an antihistamine, we would recommend never using Benadryl. And in fact, there's a Canadian Society of Allergy statement that just came out very recently about that. Even though Benadryl is the oldest antihistamine and it's very readily available and often recommended because it's been so well studied for so long, it's also old. It was one of the first antihistamines that was created and it gets into the brain. And so it makes kids tired, it makes adults tired. And we had talked you know, during this webinar about how you can have brain symptoms with anaphylaxis. And what gets really confusing is if you use Benadryl and then you get tired or baby gets tired, is that the Benadryl or is that the reaction progressing? So if you're going to use an antihistamine, we always recommend using what we call a second generation or newer antihistamine. And for kids, that would be th things like Arius kids, Claritin kids, Reactant kids. For adults, you could also include Allegra, it's just basically a non-sedating antihistamine. Now, another question is, should you use the EpiPen for, or epinephrine auto-injector just for hives? And that gets much, much more complicated. I would say if hives are spreading rapidly, or you have hives after eating a food that you know that you're allergic to, I would. If it's an otherwise healthy child that hasn't eaten anything new and gets a few hives on the face and is otherwise healthy and you're not noticing anything else, I think you could use an antihistamine and watch, but that is a very gray area. Terrific, okay. Unfortunately, we've, we're coming to the end of our time already and I know there's many more questions and I, I do wanna make sure that we can let people know about some of the upcoming webinars um, that might mm -hmm. address the questions that we weren't able to get to in this. So what I'd like to just end off the session with a, a final question. You know, this session was about the science and food allergy and, and how would you summarize from your standpoint where we are in understanding the science and being able to address this condition? So I, I actually think it's a very exciting time to be an allergist. You know, I only started in my career less than a decade ago. And there's been huge advances and huge changes in clinical practice, even over that period of time, not just in terms of prevention, which we've talked a lot about today, but even in terms of potential cures, things like oral immunotherapy, ways to desensitize the body over time to foods that children are allergic to. There's a lot we don't know, and that can be frustrating, but I think we're really moving towards asking the right questions and getting the answers that we need for the families that we work with who have food allergy. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Abrams, um, for taking thank the time you. to be with us today. I know it's a really busy uh, world for the healthcare environment, mm -hmm. so we really appreciate your times to be with us today and share these insights. So Thanks I'm for gonna me. turn it, well, thank you so much. So I just um, wanna make sure that people are aware that uh, under the Creating a Better Future webinar series, we've got lots more coming up. We didn't get to some of the questions around desensitization, and certainly we wanna make sure that 
um, that that people uh, have an opportunity to hear about that. There were some questions around diagnosis. Uh, we've got some uh, webinars coming up on that. So as you'll see on the screen, we've got some past webinars um, around the uh, that have happened that you can uh, look at through recordings at foodallergycanada.ca backslash webinars. Uh, there was a very good uh, uh, conversation by Dr. Cecilia Barron on the Outlook for Therapies. What we've coming up, got coming up on May 27th, we've got that Dr. Edmund Chan, who's going to really get, dig into kind of accurate diagnosis and the madness behind the numbers. Um, and we've got some youth series coming up, both in uh, on psychosocial and, and some past series that have run on youth that are uh, available on our site. On June 17th, we've got Dr. Julia Upton that's talking about immunotherapy. So those folks who had lots of questions around desensitization um, in both adults and in children, that's a webinar I would suggest you sign up for. And then on June 24th, we have a, a more of a Q&A format in understanding when to use epinephrine featuring Dr. Moshe ben Shoshan. So we've got some really exciting things uh, coming up and we'll uh, endeavor to uh, answer many more of your questions. Um, as a reminder, uh, we will, um, you'll get a, a very short a survey from um, uh, the GoToWebinar immediately following this, and it'll pop up on your screen. And we'd really ask that you take some time uh, to fill that out, because it really is what helps us inform some of the future uh, webinars that we would, will be looking at doing at the latter part of the year. And uh, you know, it, it really also makes us understand as to whether we've sh there are some areas of, the, of uh, our website where we should enhance some of the content to better address your questions. We would like to thank our sponsors for this webinar series, Allerject, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, and EpiPen. Over the next few days, a recording of this webinar will be available at foodallergycanada.ca backslash webinars. Be sure to share with others who may benefit. Thank you for joining us. This now concludes our webinar.